welcome everybody. I greet you in the name of Radical Feminism from Kampala, Uganda, Shira, um, Iman from oh, Somaliland. So. Doreen is also there from Kenya and uh, Reem is with us from Sudan. Um, so I always like to um, start by asking our panelists um, where they kind of are in their feminism and how they're doing really at this time. I will start. Um, I am. I consider myself as a Pan-Africanist womanist, and that is because my feminism um, is rooted in my Africanness, in my blackness. Um, I see my Africanness, my African identity, uh, at the center of everything I do, and as well as my, um, you know, womanhood. They're not separate for me. Uh, and how am I doing? It's it's complicated. Um, Sometimes I'm okay, sometimes I'm not okay. For so the issue of where am I in my feminism? I think recently I'd gotten a burnout. The, but then, like, I have gotten like, support from fem fellow feminist women. And then it doesn't matter if whatever you're fighting for, you don't see it. But at least you would have contributed to that. Uh, thank you, Serena. I'm welcome. I'm happy. I'm a foreign strong able to speak and contribute with my community. So I, I talk about as in, in as a general and background. So man, as you know, is an undocumented country which is still under the construction after the collapse of the Somali government in 1991. As a uh, as a social worker, my role during this difficult and ambiguous time was to support the spread and the expansion of the pandemic in in different ways. As a gender and human rights advocate, my work was to create full effective due to in, in, in increasing uh, movement, restriction, and lack of awareness among the poor and the disadvantaged women. In Somalia, women are the breadwinners. Actually, um, most women across the region do not have the means to, to implement the regular and hand washing and social distancing. I uh, was supporting a local women organization for the lawyers that I was working now, which is able to support in the prison and those who face the marital different ideal was providing personal protective materials like the face, face mask, hand gloves to the female detainees in the Somalian prisons, also providing sanitary kits and hand washing facility to the female at the detainee centers. So we actually face a lot of challenges, but we are trying as advocates and feminist to be strong. I'm at a point where, I mean, I really feel very like burnt out or like, I just feel very, I, very tired. And I think, I mean, as a feminist, this does make me feel guilty because you feel that you have to just continue, you know, struggling and you have to continue fighting. But I think one of the things that I just started to do this year is one, definitely work with women, work with younger women and train them. So I was part of, uh, you know, I like as a trainer and as coordinator uh, or co-coordinator for two feminist schools that were held in Sudan. So we were training women, younger women from different parts of Sudan and the training, it was an intensive feminist school. We need so many women uh, and to, to basically to understand and to to adopt feminism as you know as a way of life for them as a, as a framework to analyze uh, what they want to do and as a and as a way to to approach basically the changes they want to do in society so we need more women to do this kind of work um, but I think one of the things that and that I also decided to do this this year is I want to really just start disengaging with um, the women's rights work in Sudan if I want to approach an issue, it needs to be from a feminist perspective and we need to be fighting our issue as feminists and not just as, you know, through, through the women's rights movement and so on. There is a, a, I mean, a huge distinction between the women's movement and feminism. Uh, and there's also power in naming ourselves. Also, we want to also, you know, challenge the fact that uh, African women have been systematically erased from the pan-Africanist movement. And, and, and also for me, Pan-Africanism is the unity of the people wherever they are, the unity of the black people wherever they are. And it's for me, the, the unity of black women wherever we are. And uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and you know go through the questions. I mean, we know that we're in a global pandemic, right? Um, 
So how have you been able to do your advocacy work, you know, amid this uh, global pandemic? Uh, what tools work best uh, from your lived realities? We saw that there were problems arising that are that were like a direct result of the pandemic. I mean, we did see a rise in gender-based violence because, I mean, basically, you know, abusive partners just had more time and more hours to spend with their, you know, with women, and they had more space basically to be violent. At some point, the Ministry of uh, the something called the Unit of uh, to Combat Violence Against Women, which is part of the Ministry of Social Development, they started a hotline for women suffering from gender-based violence, but then Sudan lacks the infrastructure. So there are no shelters, for example, for, for you know, victims of violence to go to. Um, so it all really just came down to, you know, to us basically being this infrastructure, you know? So I, for example, I had, uh, you know, a young woman stay with me because she had a problem at home. And I had another friend who also hosted a few women, you know, uh, uh, during that time. But recently with COVID-19, um, we've been really under a lot of pressure because more and more women are needing help. Unfortunately, our challenge is to ensure that with this COVID-19 emergency that's going to be ongoing, uh, you know, worldwide, how do we sustain this, uh, this support group so that if a second wave hits Sudan, we are basically even, we are ready before it does. So between uh, March and uh, May, uh, the whole COVID situation was marked by a lot of like episodes of uh, homelessness, loss of, of property and uh, source of income. Then there was a surge in uh, violence against sex workers. And then we were even uh, named as uh, the transmitters of the COVID pandemic because we tend, some of our client base is uh, attract truck drivers. So we were subjected to a lot of violations, uh, a lot of, uh, physical verbal attacks. Some women, uh, from the experiences we've been documenting, were locked up with uh, clients who later became abusive towards them. Then there was uh, inaccessibility of SRH services, for example, the abortion part, then uh, condoms and all that. Since we were not moving, we were not able to access such services. Uh, so we switched our advocacy to virtual. We uh, had to post messages, calling out campaigns on stopping violence against sex workers. We documented the stories deeply uh, in regards to how the victims are feeling. Then uh, we collaborated with other feminist organizations, for example, Akina Mama or Africa, to create uh, and Girl Talk Africa, which is uh, managed by Choose Yourself. Uh, we, we managed to create safe spaces where we were, we were talking about uh, things that matter to us as non-binary women. Uh, then we developed, of course, uh, messages in local languages and English. We realized that not everyone could afford the internet. So we developed the messages and uh, disseminated them on a door-to-door -door basis. Then we bought bicycles and we were still, we delivered uh, SRH services. We also uh, established a crisis intervention center where we are providing reproductive health counseling, anxiety counseling, we developed also a tool on managing COVID anxiety. Uh, COVID affected us all, but there are those ones who are affected severely. So what we had to do as uh, in solidarity, we had to look into ourselves and get from our own pockets and try to fundraise buy food because very many sex workers were exempted from getting food. Uh, people saying that you're not part of the community. Then later, after the lifting of the lockdown, we managed to conduct the dialogue with duty bearers. So it was duty bearers who either keep quiet or who are the perpetrators of violence. Apart from that, then what we did, we conducted community awareness sessions. We, we needed to communicate to communities, like the mainstream community, that sex workers are human beings. We have a right to be like anyone else. Let me give the opportunity to Iman um, for her to tell us how she's been able to do her advocacy work in Somaliland and the situation there. This, uh, the women in Somaliland, especially the organizationists, lawyers, and uh, in, in Negat, although we don't have a network like the Pan African feminists in Somaliland, there's no, but we have another network. Um, we are organizing themselves and we are trying how to help the, our community. Um, but 
Also, we are using the community awareness for mobile and vehicles that are arresting for microphones and, and send the message. And also, we are using the posters for, for messages. Also, we are trying to make a prepare a message to the radio because of mostly local people, they are listening to the local radio. Then we are preparing the message how this pandemic is realistic. But we have also faced a lot of challenges because of the women in Somalia, they are very vulnerable. When it's closer to the schools, a lot of students become dropouts, especially the, the girls. The girls, then they are focused on the work housemate, they are become busy. That's one thing. And the rural area, when they go outside, they try to go water and to take the water from the, the far area or maybe the char charcoal is, they face an event. So right now we have faced the number of rapes increased, also in, in number of rapes and killing increased in this nowadays. We increase in how to make our awareness and contact with the government, the elimination of gender basic violence and also stress mental breakdown. And we are trying how to create the, the jobs, although we need a lot of fun, but we are trying to look for. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate the insights. This is what we've been fighting for every day, right? Uh, through our work, through our writing, through our speaking, all of you are doing incredible work. So we, we've said that there are some regional similarities in terms of you know the things we've been exposed to. Uh, but have then been have there been any collaborative, you know, regional collaborative? you know, Pan-African feminist movement building or collective work, apart from this space, have you seen any other space where women from different African countries are, you know, coming um, on a platform and kind of, you know, mapping out uh, mitigation efforts or just discussing their issues, you know, just because there's power in speaking, right? No matter how much we're afraid silence, there's power in speaking. And I just wanted to know um, if you've been, um, you know, um, if, if, if you've noticed any type of, you know, Pan-African solidarity movement building. Uh, so Pan-African is not existing or maybe not have a collaboration with the Somalian land. Also, they have worked with the Siha, Siha is under uh, Negat, another local NGO. Uh, but if they try and to, to, to make a collaboration with the Somaliland movement, especially feminist women in Somaliland, it could take part with the elimination of the gender and basic violence, also take part with the stress and mental breakdown. Maybe we can collaborate with the loss of job and the financial consequences and facing in women. And you know, the women, all especially the women who have the, the sick people, we need a support. Okay, there have been uh, a few collaborations uh, regarding uh, coming up as Africans from very African women from very from several countries, and this was managed by Akinamamo Africa Festival, uh, where they created uh, very many webinars where we could uh, share experiences from Kenya, from Zambia, from Ghana, from. Uh, I think it's Botswana. There are very many women who are sharing their experiences. Then uh, another space that I actually also participated in was uh, the one uh, held by Girl Talk Africa, Choose Yourself. It was more of a space where we were sharing our experiences. We were actually just sharing things uh, that, are, that affect uh, feminist leaders during COVID time. And it really felt like, you know, we were one and we were there for each other as sisters. Uh, I should say that we need to really strengthen our collaboration. I think for me, I mean, the regional collaborative um, efforts that I really identify with or the ones that I that really like meant a lot to me is the website African Feminism because it, I think it's a very important platform for pe feminists in Africa and especially in the region. And I have personally learned a lot uh, you know, from like reading for what other feminists are doing uh, in the region, whether it's, um, you know, fighting different forms of discrimination, dealing with the COVID-19 emergency and so on. Only The only positive aspect of the COVID emergency is actually that I saw a lot of uh, uh, 
online seminars that were organized by African feminists. Finally, one of the challenges for me with this building, this regional collaborative work is also maybe the language barrier. And this is a problem that we face in Sudan because I mean, most people don't speak English. So um, so it's, it's very difficult for us to engage in, um, in, in, you know, like the regional Horn of Africa, East Africa networks because of the language barrier. This issue of language, um, we don't have an African language uh, that we all speak, uh, you know, um, and, and, and that's, I think, one of the ideals of Pan-Africanism is kind of to bring the, you know, the people of Africa together. And there needs to be a huge conversation about who is also being left behind when we say, you know, there is access, particularly women. Um, let me just go through the, um, our third point of discussion. Uh, so the general faulty perception uh, is that, you know, this, this, this concept of feminists being resilient or even African feminists being resilient, right? Uh, that somehow feminists should be accustomed to pain. There's this conception amongst, you know, those who don't even qualify feminists as human beings that we should continue to produce free labor. I mean, what are your views on that? Uh, I mean, have you faced that kind of sentiment from uh, your working environment? My, my view around uh, feminists being resilient, yes, of course, we are resilient because it takes uh, a strong person to really stand up and speak out against any injustice. But it doesn't mean that we are numb to pain and we don't have this, like, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't, have needs as well as feminists. So we shouldn't say we are working for free. At one point, we really, as a feminist, we believe in economic justice. So you, you are not going to exploit someone because they say they are feminists. Uh, so uh, lastly, it is okay to take a break as feminists. We can say today, uh, this month, let me take a break. Of course, we are very many women who really care. Take a break, reset and restart again. Totally, I do disagree with the idea of feminists being resilient, but they should not go on the risk of uh, devastation alone. And feminism must exist to empower each other, supporting their existence and enhance empathy and towards empowering female community in globally. And we need a more conversation and collaboration among themselves first. And also we need to recognize as a woman we can do a lot because of the this uh, wrong notion. Feminists are the backbone of the social and the economic, as we know, development and the contribution in all the sectors. Also, feminist resilience sh should not be a ticket misusing them, but supporting them to mark the, to control the, the pandemic. So we need to take that idea. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes, yes, I, I completely agree. For me, the way I understand and navigate my feminism is feminism is an act of love. Uh, we're doing the work that we do because we want to see a safe uh, environment for everybody, right? Uh, in our multiplicities. Uh, my fourth point of discussion is that, you know, during this COVID-19 crisis, uh, has there been any mention from your government, from your, I mean, responses from your governments, particularly uh, to address, you know, uh, the gendered impacts of COVID-19. Uh, actually, the government, uh, in, in one, talking about the government, the Somalian government system are still growing. And the feminist uh, voice never existed in my country. So the government has weak system and largely dominated by the male, feminist and women. And the feminist uh, and women agenda do not overcome to the table. Humanitarian issue and affecting women in not and uh, it's not even uh, discussed on the government agenda. So the issue, the world of feminist, even it's new for us. Um, although we use the word of gender and that gender of people they know as a feminist. So what they say as a feminist, they they, they say as someone who's working aside only. Yes, of course, COVID, the, the emergence of COVID really undermined uh, the work we've been doing as feminists. Uh, but uh, around uh, August 21st, the court asserted in, uh, in favor, like passed uh, a ruling in favor of uh, rights to maternal health care services. 
Uh, this came after several women dying. They were dying on the roadside because they couldn't reach the hospitals. They were, uh, uh, they were dying in their homes, uh, giving birth on the roadside. So this uh, was very. This ruling was very timely because they ordered the, the, the government to put a budget allocation to ensure that health workers are fully trained, uh, and the whole, all health centers are fully equipped with uh, all the, the equipment that are necessary during uh, reproductive health. I think in Sudan, I mean, one of the issues is that feminists are not very much organized. Okay, and many of us grudgingly work with, you know, within women groups. And although there is a large scale movement to change a lot of the situation for Sudanese women, especially after the 2019 revolution, you know, by like, you know, removing discriminatory laws that criminalize women's lives and presence, removing institutional barriers to equality, the reforms so far have been influenced by a very kind of mellow women's rights agenda that is barely changing the status quo and like creating radical change within the gender power dynamics. For example, I mean, I know cases, uh, you know, of like women uh, who have men working under them as like deputies, and they make a, they make it a very difficult working environment for them that they can't actually basically do anything. So this creates a situation where women have positions, but they don't have power to make change. The second thing is how do we comprehensively solve the problems that are basically affecting women's participation? And, and it's not just being in power, but also having power and, being, and, and having access to an agenda that allows you to impose institutional and organizational, re organizational reforms. We are not just putting women there and just kind of letting them burn and letting them suffer and letting them, you know, basically feel so helpless, you know, without changing the situation. Thank you so much for that. Yes, um, you know, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, feminists are always being erased from, you know, uh, movements that we help and agitate and I mean from the change that well, we bring about we're always erased and completely made invisible. My final point would be um, you know the uncertainties are like devastating right? Uh, so what are the solutions like? I mean what are the feminist solutions we are you know putting forward? I mean to address you know this the gendered impact of COVID-19 so I know the solution is that demands to have we need to increase the positive collaboration and the idea shared among the feminist groups worldwide and mean in the pan African one. Also have a clear plan on how to explain it the feminist idea, especially in Somaliland, Ethiopia and all we need. Because of when it's happening with the same area like Sudan, Uganda, we can reach the other countries. Feminists should support and advocate the government to approach community with the gender lens. So the other, we have the voices and our focus we need to push and the support to how to read at least the government message. Right now, uh, our feminist demands would be, uh, we urge uh, donors or whoever, or will wishers to increase and offer urgent funding for feminist work or any funding that is uh, towards uh, violence against women. Uh, then the other issue would be prioritize digital and security training. Now that the new normal is uh, being online, like the virtual uh, activism. Then uh, for self-care, of course, we need it. Just in case of burnout, we get exhausted. We hear a lot of very, very many uh, sad stories and we carry them on our shoulders. So it weighs us down sometimes. So we need to prioritize also self-care. And let's think of the women on the ground who are illiterate, the women who cannot afford data, uh, the women who are who don't have uh, hospitals in their areas, the women who are who are still facing heightened risks of gender violence. I mean, for me, I think, I mean, we're still grappling with the gendered impact of, you know, COVID-19. And it, we're still kind of coming to terms with it because it's having different manifestations in different contexts and in different countries and so on. In, in Sudan, one of the things that I was thinking about is that it has affected the work of female doctors. So, I mean, we remained lucky because of the rapid decline in cases, but this also meant that, I mean, female, we're going to see more female doctors existing in the field if COVID-19 hit Sudan as hard as it did in March uh, 
you know, in between March and May 2020. Most Sudanese women work in the informal sector, so over 60% work in the informal sector as the food sellers, petty traders, and so on. So they were overwhelmingly hit during that COVID-19 emergency. And um, although the government attempted to provide some kind of basic food items to support, you know, their families, there was no thorough analysis to ensure that the specific needs of, for example, women-headed households, single mothers, and women from conflict areas are taken into consideration so that there is no like one solution fits, uh, you know, and one size fits all kind of situation. Now I would like to give uh, the opportunity to our, um, you know, participants. If, if you have any questions for our panelists, uh, now would be the time. Mine is really not adding or a question, but uh, to acknowledge the amount of work that feminists are doing, you know, despite the disruptions, despite the difficulties because they are difficulties you know you know when you just say it or when people say it in person they don't think through all the situations or all the circumstances that people have to go through when shira was speaking i don't know whether it was shira or rim but there was somebody who talked about um how how people or how your constituents the people who look up to you would come knocking and asking for help so this is to appreciate the work that has been ongoing and to say thank you to the feminist maybe we don't hear these um there's nothing much i can give as a congratulator or award to the feminist who are doing this but to say thank you for the work that you're doing uh, patricia i i see that you've uh, raised your hand please go ahead so for me, what I would like to hear from the panelists, how do we ensure that as we are also working towards um, inclusiveness and also getting to understand our privileges and even the privileges of different women, women in the rural settings, women uh, or people who are having living with disabilities, uh, people who can hear. So, how can we ensure that the approaches we are using reach them, that even as we get feedback, we design different programs that at least can be inclusive enough? Thank you. Yes, Patricia, thank you for raising that point. Uh, actually talked about uh, pushing for policies that acknowledge intersection of feminism and when we talk about intersectionality that is when we are talking about uh, marginalized women women uh, in the rural areas women who can't hear women who are who are rich and women who are not things like that so uh one way i should say that yes it's it's about pushing for those policies because our needs really do differ um, and I would like to also, I think, um, answer this or just kind of to reflect on what you were said. We kind of perpetuate this, you know, by uh, marginalizing women from the work and by by really kind of thinking that we're all equal or that we all have the same access to, you know, to to resources, basically, which is not true. Like a few examples. One, I am, I think, uh, one of few people in Sudan that can access Zoom because in, in Sudan, Zoom is blocked unless you access it through a VPN. So, and to, to have a VPN and also use Zoom, this means you need a very, very strong connection, which is expensive and you have to live in, in specific areas. So I think like we have to be very careful about how we communicate, where we meet, you know, the times we have meetings, you know, and ask, you know, the women in our network. So what, what works for you, you know? Part of the patriarchy, the part of basically like supporting the patriarchal system is, is creating and contributing to a structure that excludes women, right? So we don't want to be like that. I see some comments in the chat box just um, kind of agreeing to the points that were being said. Uh, Maria says, yeah, she, she, the digital activism is elitist, but it's uh, what we have to content within this uh, peculiar times. However, we should consider local media networks and local dialects for communications. Yes, which is true. Um, Tam, Tamzi, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, hey everyone, my name is Hunki Manzi from South Africa. I have an issue with my mic. I would just wish to say thank you for creating this platform. I'm glad that you are discussing issues of access and inclusivity, especially during this pandemic. Thank you for that. 
So we had a discussion at the African Union uh, that was um, organized by African women, by one of the, uh, the African women spaces. Um, and they did not have, you know, there were accessibility issues. So some participants couldn't access the building. Um, so these are the kind of things we have to think about as feminists and as uh, people who deploy the intersectional tool, particularly, I think the intersectional feminism tool helps us analyze, you know, our multiple identities and how to navigate those multiple identities. But, I mean, we have to put everybody on equal footings. So in the work that we do, are we centering, you know, some of these issues? How inclusive are we? So that was an excellent uh, point, uh, Patricia. Thank you. Mm, I think, um, I, I mean, if there's anything else you'd like to add our panelists or anybody from the participants, if there's anything you'd like to add, the floor is yours. Now would be the time. Please go ahead. I just want to share um, a lot of positive energy and, and just keep doing what you're doing. And I'm very proud of all the panelists and the participants here. And this was a very good opportunity. And um, as much as it's very exhausting to live in our societies and just to keep fighting, I hope we can fight in unison soon. Yeah, I don't have much uh, to say. Just we need to improve our co communication and collaboration as a feminist in Africa. So thank you, everybody. And I would like to also thank uh, the Henry Schmoltz uh, Foundation for, you know, um, kind of facilitating this space for us. Doreen, thank you. Caroline, thank you. Angeline, thank you, everybody behind the scene and also on this platform. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.